Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Paul Graney. Here today's top stories. The partial tally is in from last night's caucus meetings in Iowa, and Mayor Pete Buttigieg appears to have taken the lead, with Bernie Sanders following close behind. This after the state's Democratic Party delayed the results report until around 5 p.m. today. And President Trump is slated to give his State of the Union address to Congress on Capitol Hill. It starts tonight at 9 Eastern Time. A funeral home staff member in Wuhan told us they're on call 24 hours a day and facing a shrinking supply of body bags. This amid China's coronavirus outbreak. As more emphasis is placed on holistic learning, more schools are working towards embedding social and emotional growth into their everyday curriculum. And the French National Library holds a huge exhibit on the author of The Lord of the Rings. Find out what rare exhibits, what rare items the exhibit holds. The first set of results from last night's Iowa caucus is in. So far, South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg has taken the lead with almost 27% of the vote. He's followed closely by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who claimed just over 25%. This after the state's Democratic Party delayed reporting the results last night. We have said all along that we were going to make uh, these caucuses the most transparent possible. A delay to the results of the Iowa Democratic Caucus. Tens of thousands of voters poured into schools, community centers, and other public locations around Iowa. Voters spent hours sorting through a field of nearly a dozen candidates Monday night. Des Moines, Iowa is the first caucus in the run to find the Democrat that will take on Republican President Trump in this year's election. Frontrunners in recent Iowa opinion polls include Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and former Vice President Joe Biden. The Iowa Democratic Party spoke of the problems that caused the delay on a Tuesday morning conference call. At this point, the IDP is manually verifying all precinct results. We expect to have uh, numbers to report later today. We want to emphasize that this is a reporting issue, not a hack or an intrusion. He said the process of validating data against the paper trail was taking longer than expected. Tom Courtney, the Democrats' co-chair of Des Moines County, said the app created for caucus organizers to report results had contributed to these issues. Some caucus organizers were forced to call in results for the state party to record manually, introducing the potential for human error. The confusion and delay over results has led some to question the integrity of the process. But Sanders and Biden said they had good feelings about the outcome of the vote. Other presidential candidates were also positive, with Elizabeth Warren saying it was too close to call. Pete Buttigieg expecting victory and Amy Klobuchar speaking to her supporters about punching above their weight. While Iowa's final results are yet to come in, candidates Warren and Biden pulled in over 18 and 15 percent of the vote respectively. And in other news, the president will give his State of the Union address this evening. Last year's speech reportedly drew in 46 million viewers. It's slated to start at 9 p.m. President Trump is slated to address Congress on Tuesday in his third State of the Union address. Each year, the president gives an update on the economy, national security, and other key issues. He also has the opportunity to speak of goals and priorities for the year ahead. This year's State of the Union address comes amid tension. A Democrat-led impeachment trial against the president has yet to conclude. It is expected that senators will vote to acquit the president on Wednesday. As is customary, the House invites the president to give the State of the Union address. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi sent a formal invitation to President Trump on December 20th. Just two days prior, the House had voted to impeach him. The address takes place in the chamber of the House of Representatives. Supreme Court justices and the Joint Chiefs of Staff usually attend. Members of Congress often invite guests as a way to bring attention to specific political positions. U.S. Senator Marco Rubio said on Monday he was bringing an advocate for the rights of China's Uyghur Muslim minority as his guest. The House voted last year for legislation calling for a tougher response to China's treatment of its Uyghur Muslims. According to convention, the Democrats' response will follow the president's speech. And hours before tonight's presidential address, the White House has released the names of this year's special guests. As usual, all 11 have quite the backstories, including a top cop imprisoned for nearly 15 years by socialist regimes. Every year, the president delivers the State of the Union. And every year since the 80s, the president invites special guests who are then recognized by the chamber. 
The White House released their identities and stories hours before the address tonight, 11 total. The Haig family from Oklahoma was invited. Gage on the right was just one year old when his father was killed by a roadside bomb while serving his duty in Iraq. The White House says the bomb that killed the staff sergeant was supplied by General Qasem Soleimani, who was killed last year by the Trump administration. But the list wasn't short of survivors. Two-year-old Ellie Schneider, one of the youngest babies to survive premature birth in the U.S., will be with her mother. And a once top cop in Venezuela, Ivan Simonovis, was also invited. Simonovis was in prison for nearly 15 years by the Chavez and Maduro socialist regimes. He was detained for protecting protesters. After his escape, he was brought to Florida, where he was accepted by immigration agents. Six other special guests are listed, and each has a story connected to the administration's policies and goals. And as the battle over Obamacare continues in a Texas district court, a Democratic coalition is asking the Supreme Court to take up the case. Republicans saying Monday it should be settled at district level first. The future of Obamacare still hangs in the balance. Republican-controlled states and the Trump administration are calling part of the health care law unconstitutional. The House of Representatives and Democrat-controlled states are trying to block their efforts. The case has been sent back to a Texas district court. The court is now trying to determine whether the individual mandate is an inseverable part of Obamacare. The individual mandate fines any American who doesn't take out insurance. The court has already agreed that it is unconstitutional. If it is deemed inseverable, Obamacare may be scrapped. Democrats are now asking the Supreme Court to rule on it. They asked the court to expedite the case and take it up this term, but were rejected. The Democrat coalition on Monday argued that the House and Democrat-led states offered no compelling reason for the Supreme Court to review a case still being decided by a lower court. They urged the court to defer the review of the decision until after the case was completed in the lower courts. Both the Texas District Court and the Fifth Court of Appeals have already deemed the individual mandate unconstitutional. It is uncertain whether the Supreme Court would take up the case. And Paul Whelan, the former American Marine being held in Moscow on espionage charges, has lost an appeal to be released from custody. It means he'll remain jailed until at least March when his formal trial is set to take place. Whelan has been in detention since agents from Russia's Federal Security Service seized him in a Moscow hotel room in December 2018 during what Whelan says was a personal trip as a tourist. He denies the spying charges and says he was framed but could face 20 years in prison if found guilty. At court hearings over the past year, Whelan, who holds US, British, Canadian and Irish passports, has asked these four governments for help. He also says he's being mistreated by authorities. Russia says it caught James Bond on a spy mission. In reality, they abducted Mr. Bean on holiday. My human rights are being violated, my life threatened, medical issues are being denied, and my property stolen. No evidence of espionage has been provided as it does not exist. Prime ministers and presidents act decisively now, provide public statements of support and act on them. Russia's foreign ministry has dismissed these allegations and has accused Whelan of trying to stir up noise around his trial. Moscow says Whelan was caught red-handed with a computer flash drive containing classified information. Whelan says he was set up in a sting operation and had thought the drive, given to him by a Russian acquaintance, contained holiday photos. Whelan was visited by the US ambassador John Sullivan last week who maintains the Russians have no evidence of wrongdoing. And still to come, we delve deeper into the coronavirus outbreak in China. Nine more cities are now under lockdown. This after officials cracked down on local media reporting the true numbers. Find out more when we return. Absolutely fantastic. I don't know how you would not enjoy this. It's like a painting coming to life. I laughed, I cried, I I was so touched. The scenes, the sets, the costumes. The dancing, the choreographing, the music, everything was just spectacular. There's no words for it. It's just heavenly. This was the best. Best ever. The dancers, your mouth just drops, you're like, wow, this is just beautiful to watch. The technique is flawless. Really, it is. The skill and the talent on the stage are jaw-dropping. They perform in perfect unison. 
They're just stunning. The actual ambiance of the background, there is always the beautiful landscape and it was so colorful. I find the music amazing. The orchestra, the instruments, it was really brilliant. So moving and so powerful and uplifting. The idea of everybody coming from a celestial place, it's all beauty and truth and light. It's very emotional. It gives me inspiration. True blessing to be here and witness it all. If somebody wants to know about China, there's nothing better than seeing Shen Yun. Shen Yun is definitely something you cannot describe. It's something you have to see to believe. It's a must-see. And I would recommend this to uh, yeah, all my friends. Don't wait. Don't Get your tickets wait. now. Viewers have described China Uncensored like The Daily Show, but about China. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views, and now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the sole source of edutainment worldwide. As tensions around the world increase amid the coronavirus outbreak, more cities in China are being put on lockdown. Our reporter Tiffany Meyer brings us the details. And a warning, some of the following footage could be disturbing. The latest on the coronavirus outbreak. Three more verified cases outside China today. One was a 42-year-old woman who tested positive for the virus in South Korea after a visit to Thailand. The other two were in Thailand, which today confirmed it had six cases of the coronavirus. It is not yet clear if the couple that got infected contracted the virus in Japan or when they went back in Thailand. This comes amid increasing concern ahead of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics this summer. 42 airlines have now suspended flights to and from China. And now to China, where the coronavirus originated. Nine more cities put on lockdown today. The cities are Zhenzhou, Hangzhou, Lingyi, Harbin, Ningbo, Fuzhou, Xuzhou, Nanjing, and Lecheng. The closest to Wuhan, the epicenter of the coronavirus, is Zhenzhou, nearly 300 miles away. And Harbin is the furthest at 1,450 miles away, close to the Russian border. China's leader, Xi Jinping, declared a prevention plan against the epidemic today. What he did not declare was that it was also a war for the Chinese Communist Party against the media. China's Central Propaganda Department recently issued an urgent internal notification, banning local media in Wuhan from disclosing the true situation of the epidemic. The media that received this order have all reported before that Chinese officials concealed the spread of the coronavirus in the beginning stage and misled the public. According to media reports, the actual number of infected people in Wuhan is at least 100,000. The death toll is far higher than the official number of 361. These reports made the international community question the official statistics. So why would the Chinese regime suppress the numbers? Video posted on social media shows what seems to be police in China rounding up people suspected of having the coronavirus. And yet people are resisting going to the hospital. Which raises the question of why are the police involved and why don't people want to go to the hospital? What are people really afraid of? And just a warning, some people might find the following footage disturbing. Videos that won't appear on Chinese state-controlled media but have been increasingly showing up online depicting people who seem to be by all means okay suddenly collapsing to the floor. A video posted to Twitter yesterday shows a person in uniform sitting in a monitoring room, then collapsing to the ground where he starts shaking violently, much like a seizure. It is not clear if he is a policeman or a security personnel at an institution. The video seems to be from a security camera in the room. There was another video published on January 25th, believed to be filmed in a hospital in Wuhan. The patient was shaking in much the same way. Some comments say it is just a seizure, while others say it could be caused by the coronavirus. Some speculate the coronavirus could infect the nervous system, which then could cause seizures. 
In China, due to the state-run media, there are still many people who believe that everything is under control. But many others have a different picture in mind. A singer from China wrote a satiric song that has now gone viral. One line translates to, after brainwashing, wash your hands and your face. Funeral home staff inside Wuhan are facing an extreme workload and a shortage of body bags. This as conditions continue to worsen in the city. And today's Xiaohua Gu has the story. Not a single day off after January 28th, unable to go home for multiple days in a row, waiting to collect and cremate bodies at any time, day or night. This is what life is like for funeral home staff inside Wuhan, the coronavirus outbreak center in China. One worker's voice has been distorted to protect his identity. We're on call 24 hours a day. Staff members will briefly take a nap after coming back and go out again if there are any phone calls, because bodies cannot be left inside hospitals for long. Videos claiming to come from funeral homes in Hubei province, where Wuhan is located, are circulating on social media. The one Yun works for used to cremate 30 bodies per day, but now they need 100 body bags on a daily basis. Yun says the dead bodies are contagious, adding that hospitals don't always wrap them. A dead person would still have some air and bacteria inside his belly, and it will come out when moving the body. That's why we have to use two bags for each person. Yun said the cremation furnaces are running 24 hours a day, though they may not be burning bodies at all times. Family members aren't allowed to see the bodies either, for fear of the infection spreading. Reporting by Xiaohua Gu, NTD News, New York. And still to come, find out what experts have to say about how to effectively teach children empathy, teamwork and resilience. That and more after the break. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. Our investigative reporters at the Epoch Times have spent 18 months uncovering the biggest political scandal in modern history. We connected the dots around Spygate, the actions by Obama-era officials against Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Join me on Declassified as we bring you up-to-date developments on this unfolding scandal. As children's mental health is becoming more of a hot topic, attention is being drawn to how emotional stability, or lack thereof, affects students' academic achievements. Currently, a handful of U.S. schools are working to implement social-emotional learning. Recent research shows that mental health illness diagnoses for children in the U.S. is on the rise. From 2012 to 2016, there was a 55 percent increase in the number of children visiting emergency departments for mental health reasons. Could it be because kids simply aren't aware of how to recognize and handle emotions? Children many times don't have the verbal skills or even the emotional skills to be able to address what it is that they're feeling inside. Some schools have started addressing this concern by teaching kids and teens to cope with emotions and develop skills like empathy, cooperation, and self-control. Some studies show it also has a positive impact on academic achievements. However, some say it's going to take more than just a change in school to make a significant impact. 
Parents are the very first teachers of children's social and emotional skills. Uh, and so teachers can really benefit from partnering from those first teachers of social and emotional skills, our parents, uh, to understand what children have learned at home and, and be mutually supportive in school. Dr. Gardier also says that building up the parent-teacher relationship is crucial. And that community of learning involves, of course, the students, but teachers, administrators, and the vital part of that, which would be the parents. Right now, all states have social-emotional learning standards for preschoolers, but less than 20 states have set standards for K through 12th grade students. Now, more are working to gradually implement social and emotional growth lessons into the curriculum. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Louisiana's pelicans and seabirds impacted by the 2010 BP oil spill will now have a much larger area to build their nests. A Louisiana island that provides a crucial nesting ground for pelicans and other seabirds is being restored to nearly its former size. Decades of coastal erosion and an offshore oil spill 10 years ago reduced it drastically. Around 6,500 brown pelicans and 3,000 smaller seabirds use Queen Bess Island as their summer nesting ground. The island had shrunk from 45 acres to just 15, but just five acres were left suitable for the birds to nest. A new project is restoring much of the lost land. In a few days, the birds are going to return, and when they do, they'll have about 36 acres uh, to, to find places for their nests. About 1,000 of the island's birds died in the BP oil spill in 2010. The money to restore the island flows from a $20 billion settlement with BP. Over 100 million gallons of oil spilled into the water. It eventually reached Queen Bess Island and ruined the nesting grounds. And the BP oil spill also covered this island, so it smothered a lot of the vegetation, which uh, expedited the, the amount of wetland loss we had out here. Queen Bess is one of Louisiana's largest nesting areas for brown pelicans. It holds up to a fifth of the state's nests. The birds will now have a more spacious area to call home during nesting season. And on the competition floor, there's a new breed in town. The Westminster Kennel Club unveiled the newest dog breed to compete in the upcoming dog show. The elegant Azawalk breed of dog was introduced on Tuesday in New York City. Six of them will compete in the Hound Group during the 144th annual Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Each year is fun and exciting because there's always something new. This year we have an additional day of the dog show on Sunday, so we've expanded the event. And we also have a new breed making its debut. This year, for the first time, Sunday, there'll be breed judging. The Hound and Herding breeds will be uh, in competition. The Azawak is originally from the West African nations of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. It was bred to hunt animals like rabbits and wild boar. Miller Bisher also added that they're very calm. But they're also very calm and like to lay on your sofa. This year, 2,500 dogs and 205 breeds will compete in the famous dog show. The dogs will be separated into seven groups. Hound, toy, non-sporting, herding, sporting, working, and terrier. The seven group winners will compete for the prized Best in Show award on February 11th. And still to come, the French National Library holds a huge exhibit on the author of The Lord of the Rings. Find out what rare items the exhibit holds. Are you tired of newspapers spinning the truth and pushing false narratives? And are you looking for honest coverage of Spygate, the true story of collusion? Or the truth behind the crisis at our southern border? Or how the Chinese Communist Party is working to subvert America and our way of life. Then you need to check out The Epic Times newspaper. It's independent, nonpartisan, and it doesn't push any political agendas. Just go to readepic.com and try it yourself for a full month for just a single dollar. You'll absolutely love it.
On January 16th, Lord of the Rings author J.R.R. Tolkien's last living son Christopher passed away. He was heir to the Tolkien Empire and spent his whole life bringing together thousands of pages of original works. Our France correspondent David Vives has the story. East Farthing Woods. The greatest journeys begin with the first step. In 1937, when John Ronald Rule Tolkien became so bored from revising his students' work that he wrote the first sentence of The Hobbit. One page of this particular book was left blank. Glorious. Nothing to read, so I scribble on it. I can't think what. In the hole of the ground there lived a hobbit. The Lord of the Rings books began as a sequel to The Hobbit. They tell the story of a little man's adventures to destroy an evil ring. The story would go on to grant his author renown. The National Library of France is holding the largest exhibition ever made about Tolkien. It has on display nearly 200 original letters, maps, drawings, and manuscripts. Tolkien's work has roots in antique traditions such as the Trojan War or Atlantis. Tolkien's first expertise is in the study of medieval literature. Here, he found inspiration to create numerous languages, with their own words and particular pronunciations. Medieval literature featured the battle between good and evil in explicit ways. Tolkien participated in the First World War in France, where he saw many of his peers dying. More than 30 years later, the British author wrote The Lord of the Rings. He said he put all his heart into it. For him, rather than being about power, the story is about how humans perceive death itself. According to the exhibition, Tolkien's enchantment reveals the world as it really is and offers hope for life. For Tolkien, fairy tales are not for children. They're a way to understand our world. Magic and fairy tales have the power to reveal complex things for what they really are. Tolkien wrote his book for his sons, who would eventually read his works, and they too would pass away. Reporting by David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Sweden is offering something a little different for those looking to take a relaxing vacation. It's an ice-cold retreat at a luxury floating hotel on a river. Called the Arctic Bath, this unique hotel is now open for business. The building's centerpiece is a circular structure that looks like a floating cluster of logs. And in the middle, there's an ice bath surrounded by saunas. But you may have to make your reservations in advance, as the hotel only has 12 guest rooms. Six are floating cabins along the riverbank, and six are elevated cabins on the shore. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Paul Graney.